call signs 32, Echo 32. Uh, this is 32, and we're going to go ahead with this show of force as of uh, 1 uh, 7 uh, 3 0 hours. I want you to focus on obvious uh, hard targets as well as any uh, uh, fields where anybody will be trying to creep up and wadis over. I just think some people are, are born for it. Some people are born to be a doctor. Some people are born to be vets or whatever. We're warriors. We, that's what we do. We're good at it. A lot of it's our training, but a lot of it's who we are. First, second World War, Korea, you know. Canadians always shine. So I guess it's our turn. We've signed on, we've said we'll take the lead and we'll show you how to fight, so... Uh... And you're in the front lines. Yes. But don't tell my mother that. Because we're just the best there is, so you'd be crazy to fuck with us. There were 2,300 Canadians serving in Afghanistan while we were there. Fewer than a thousand leave the base to patrol this moonscape of dust and danger. They call it going outside the wire. We spent October with the troops at Kandahar Airfield, in Panjwe, a traditional Taliban stronghold, and in Spin Boldak, a forward operating base on the Pakistan border. A convoy from Kandahar Airfield to Spin Boulder. Inside the armored vehicle, it's cramped, dark, and uncomfortable. I'm told if there's an attack, I'll be thrown in a ditch and just stay down. After about two hours, we arrive at Spinbolduk, or forward operating base Kostel, a sleepy frontier post. Veterans of battle are regrouping, resting, healing. They lost over half the platoon due to injuries. There was one death. And um, right now we're in a reconstitution phase. We just got our replacements on the ground. So SPIN is also a training center. That's not a tank. It's a light armored vehicle, a lav. The soldiers call them boats. Later in Panjwe, I would see lavs cruise over the sand. Not here. This is driving school. A lot of young guys, a lot of very inexperienced guys, that, uh, most of which have less than two years in the military. Uh, some guys have less than a year. Who's next? Yeah. Come on, Kirk. Come on. Kirk. You have some get up there. Sergeant Scott Russell is a patient, though somewhat profane, instructor. Get in your fucking order and come down. I'm sending two guys around that corner at a time, all right? I'm the third guy in the order of merch, so I'm going to come out and start buying it, all right? They don't have much time to get the replacements up to speed. Okay, now start picking up your spacing. Open space right. Okay, open space clear. Guys have been through a lot, and guys that uh, have got pretty close, so coming in as a replacement, it's, uh, it's hard, you know. We gotta, we gotta try and make that brotherhood as well, and then we gotta do it in a short period of time, because we're getting thrown right to the fire. You're the number two. You're gonna take the bomb, obviously, hold it in the tip of your hand. You can just let go, drop it gently. As soon as you drop it, you're gonna bring your hand around and down. So you get it out the way quickly. If you don't get it out of the way qu quickly, 
you're going to be losing fingers because when that bomb shoots out, it's going to take a thumb or a finger with it. I've never been in it. I, I've never been in what everybody calls the shit. I don't know if you can put that on camera or not, but I've never been in anything like that, so it's hard to say if I'm ready. Uh, I'm as ready as, uh, as I can be. If something did go off, a car bomb and that, you're going to lose a couple guys, but that's, you always lose somebody. And that, that brings the point why it's important to have your point man. He's the guy that has to approach the vehicle. Somebody has to take the risk, and he's the sacrificial lamb. How many in the vehicle? Can't really prepare for it, really. <laughs> you can tell him what's going to happen. You're going to be like just mentally prepared, but things go down and people die, then how do you prepare for that, really? The last time 8 Platoon was on television, it was a rap ceremony on the news. In October, they are still nursing wounds and memories of a month ago, Panjoy, where they fought in Operation Medusa. When I turned around, my buddy Keegan was standing there in the air gunner's hatch, just covered in blood, so I asked him what was up, and he just looked at me and said, Kushle. I asked if it was uh, good to go. He said no. But, you know, you don't have time to mourn for it right there. You got a job to do. Turned around, kept doing what I had to do. Not easy. Uh, my warrant, Mellish, uh, he was the best warrant I've ever had. Probably, and hopefully not, the best warrant I'll ever have, but uh, one of the last things he said to one of the fellows before uh, things, before his unfortunate uh, incident uh, was, you hold this line, don't give an inch. Today's payback day, boys, we're gonna get him. And uh, he walked off to make sure his friend was okay or to see what he could do. And that was the, the last time we saw our warrant. Oh. Making a jump! Medusa was the biggest battle Canadians have been in since Korea. 8th Platoon was in the thick of it. Then the next morning, the platoon was strafed by an American plane, an A-10 Warthog. They were literally gunned down in friendly fire. Same, Same time. So I was out there brushing my teeth with uh, my Master Corporal Bellamy, and I saw two of those little sparks go. I knew instantly what it was. Uh, ran and dove into the back of the lav. The Master Corporal quick on his feet as well, and he dove in as well. If the Taliban was a water bottle. Uh, fortunately for me, and unfortunately for him, he landed on top of me and took a couple hits for me. But that's what Master Corporals do, I guess. Thompson got some, Mitch got some, I got some. A lot like all pretty well everybody in our platoon got some. I got hit in both triceps and then in the face here. I just got two shrapnel in my back. About 16 injured, not more. One KIA, Private Graham. The Crazy Eights became famous. Warriors one day decimated the next. I, th I think no company has been affected in the such a, since the Korean War. Um, yeah. We were rendered ineffective, uh, combat ineffective, and uh, out of my platoon, there was eight of us fit for redeployment. Let's the lighter. Pull mm. those first. Call it near, okay? Call it blank. In battle, you depend on the guy beside you. They've got to get to know each other. Cody. Cody? Guys, eh? Mike. Cody. You're fucking picked by, uh, what's your name? Fergie. Fergie, you're on Fergie's team. I got Reed too then. Reed? Yeah. Who's Reed? Right Roof. <laughs> this was a platoon that prided itself in its cohesiveness, teamwork. But the replacements are untested. Still, the replacements are beating the older guys at foosball, much to the frustration of John Bellamy. He's the master corporal who jumped into the back of the lab and took the shrapnel heading for Private Keegan. Thank you. He didn't want to be interviewed, then challenged me to a game of chess. As we plot the movement of knights and pawns, he relives the horrible morning of the A-10 attack. The guy who died, everybody speaks very highly of. Mm -hmm. The Olympic uh, athlete. Yeah, Mark Graham. He was a very good soldier. 
he uh, will definitely be missed. One of the guys said it was pretty interesting for all the, the near misses because, you know, an inch left or right or a centimeter left or right and you would have been dead. But there's so many cases of that, it was unbelievable. Well, you're case in point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the piece of shrapnel traveled in my back through the muscle and is uh, apparently pretty close to my spine at L3, buried in amongst some nerves. Jeez. So that they left it in because they said it'd uh, do more damage taking it out than it would leaving it in. So you got a souvenir of Panjway. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have taken a different type of souvenir home, but you know, take what you can get, I suppose. God, I'm stupid. Foolish moves. I'd take it. It's, it's a gift. <laughs> Don't expect it again. Think these young kids are ready? Not even close. The new ones that we just got? Yeah. Nobody can prepare you for uh, some of the things that you're going to see out there. Throwing your dead friend in the back of your boat. How do you prepare for somebody for that, you know? You can't. We know we will be going to Panjoy soon. We just don't know when. We've been with 8th Platoon in Spin Baldock for a couple of days. The border with Pakistan has been quiet. Pop down, see if you can see anything on the horizon. Still, they keep eyes on in the lab as the training continues. I got sheep. Yeah, I got tractor. Uh, hey, is that a camel out there? There's a pretty good chance. Holy fuck, I've never seen a camel before. How the fuck have you never really? seen a camel? Man, look at the size of that camel, that's huge. All right, guys, what you're here to do is to listen to my version of what happened on the third. From this low wall here, all the way to here, from the school, and from these compounds here, the enemy had us in a U-shaped ambush. This was a prepared kill zone. Sergeant Scott Fawcett briefs the replacements with his personal account of September 3rd, Operation Medusa. So once we got the casualty collection point up and going, it is mayhem. You have wounded coming in. You still have a battle ongoing. You are taking stress casualties and you have taken dead. You have to stay focused on what you're doing. I know you're tired. I know you're mentally stressed out. I know you're terrified. All right, but the enemy was still engaging us even out in the wadi. All right, so when you get out of the back of that boat and all the casualties are being carried in and all the battlefield noises are coming in, you still have a job to do and you have to do it. All right. Canadians have been holed up in the base but visiting American engineers need support in the town of Spin Boulder. Some of 8 platoon are assigned to protect them. There's some anxiety. This is the first operation for the replacements. What is this exactly? A 
this is basically just an American compound that they're building in. And uh, they were coming to check on the progress of uh, how everything was being built. They were getting pictures and stuff and sit, sit, sit around situation reports basically as to how it was coming along, but they wanted to see for themselves how it was doing. Eventually, Afghan police working from this station will try to control the region's drug trafficking. Get trash? While the Americans tour the construction site, the Canadians keep watch outside. That crazy eight badge is not military issue. That's just for eight platoon veterans. Sergeant Chris Jeeps leads the operation. You constantly move, you don't want to stand in one spot in case there's any chance of uh, sniper fire. And it doesn't create a, a good target for the enemy to hit you with. So. There was maybe two occasions where my heart rate sped up a little bit. A couple of Afghani guards wanted to come in and they didn't understand why they couldn't and we wanted them to stay back until we can confirm who they were. Um, they, I guess, feel they don't need to confirm themselves, but we, we really, really do. And so uh, they had a problem with that. first experience with having to, to worry about possibly having to pull the trigger. You were ready to pull the trigger if you had to? Absolutely. There's nothing on this planet that would make me want to leave my wife and little girl without a husband and father. So that's what it boils down to. I'm here to protect myself, my fellow soldiers, and my family. The mission is a success. Some soldiers said they heard gunfire warning shots. I didn't. But a few days later, there was an attack. On the same road we had traveled to town, an IED, an improvised explosive device, exploded under an Afghan national policeman's car. He was rushed to the base. Roger, we'll be bringing him in by gators momentarily. Do we have an ETA on that boat when it's coming in? You'll get it when we get it. Roger. He would lose one foot and almost the other. Lift! Good work, guys. You walk on over, you can hand the IV bag to the medic. I'm going to hop up here with the doc. You need any more back here? Or are you good? Uh, good back here if I, yeah. Uh, with the mass corporate right there. Okay, the whole you just need one there? Just take it easy, not too fast. Real fucking easy. For the replacements, it's been an eventful week. Their first mission, a paramedical procedure, and finally their orders. They are to head back to Kandahar Airfield, then on to Panjway. Do we still have that travel piece? At the airfield, 8th platoon hooks up with Lieutenant Jeremy Hiltz, who's been on leave. It's been a quiet month on Highway 1 through Kandahar City, and that makes people nervous. The most possible uh, threat to us today is in the, in the vicinity of Sirache, right here. Okay, there is an uh, ambush position set up. Uh, Lieutenant Hiltz's briefing is blunt and, and chilling. Everything that can happen to us out there is a variation of one thing. We get attacked, okay? Adjust as we go through, and I'll give direction as well as the section commanders and crew commanders will give direction as we're going along, okay? Are there any other points from the section commanders? Okay. When we get through Panjway at last light, that's our favorite time for hitting. 
So be prepared for anything. <clears throat> That's all I got, sir. Okay. Like I said before, I'll support any decision you guys make. I'm not with you in that vehicle. Your section commanders aren't right necessarily up there making the same decision you guys got to do. You see something that doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy, escalate as you see fit. If you don't know your ROEs, <laughs> talk to your section commanders and clarify anything, okay? Once we leave this gate, it's game on until we get back into here, okay? It'll be a long time, who knows, okay? It's good times, boys. You get the soldier, it's awesome. Okay, you got guys beside you, like I said. Let's get our heads into the game, and let's do the job. Right on, good to go. Mount up. This is a volunteer army. This is what they signed up for. There is more a feeling of excitement than fear as the convoy heads outside the wire to Panjai. This is one of the most dangerous roads in the world. Eight platoon rumbles through the chaos of Kandahar City and then Ambush Alley. Some Afghan children wave, some gesture, some throw things. Yeah, there's rocks coming already. That was a nice one. That was a good one. Guys like Randy Power and Peter Mitchell have taken this trip before. A few tense, cramped hours heading west. At first in Panjouet, all you see, breathe and feel is dust. The desert seems covered in talcum powder. It's a land of wadis, dry riverbeds, hiding Taliban fighters, natural trenches, like the ones 8 platoon now call home. Half the platoon settles in Strong Point North. Just 1,300 meters away, the rest camp in Strong Point Center. They are assigned to guard the construction of a road which will carve through Panjwa. Paving the dust will make travel more efficient and much safer. But six soldiers have already died defending this road. So if we keep traveling up and down the way it is now with that moon dust, it's very easy for them to plant IEDs. So. The faster we get it built, the faster things will start moving. My IDs to me worry me more than anything. Like, I know I worry about Taliban, but not as much because I know what we got. I know we got labs. I know we got, like, I trust everybody in my platoon, everybody in my company. I know they're good to go. I know we can take them, but, you know, IDs are, those are like unexpected things. <laughs> IEDs, or improvised explosive devices, aren't their only concern. They have to keep a watchful eye. Uh, if we have any suspicions or any ideas about uh, where an uh, enemy may try to push into, uh, we'll uh, push out and try to preempt them. You see it, Dawson? Yep. Yeah, there's two of them. There's two of them now. <laughs> Sergeant Jeeps leads a group, including an interpreter, to question a suspicious family. From a safe distance, they check for suicide bombs, then move closer. Where are they coming from? 
Sometimes we are with them. Sometimes they are bringing along. Okay, that's fine. Right? Yeah, that's okay. If he just when he goes to get wood, that's what I say. That push in around. I was slash. Just keep back a little bit. Ah, that's what I say. 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 Sound like he was a little upset. Yeah. Yes. Was he? Yeah. The other guy is his brother, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's head back. Let's just see. Yeah, there's really no front line because, you know, that's guerrilla warfare. But, yeah, it's as close as you can get to the enemy and you know, reach out and touch them almost. But Because you know they're probing out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's the wadis out there and the great fields, like, there's probably a guy out in that field we can't even see right now. It's it's ridiculous, but just gotta kind of stay here and wait for them to pop their head up, I guess. Almost every day they go out on patrol. Stay in the tire tracks. Today they hook up with the ANA, the Afghan National Army. The two strong points meet. They will probably that fucking gray putt and basically behind it is going to probably be our right of mark because we can't fire anything down close to Yeah, well, you guys are going to lose sight of us once we hit that tree line anyways. It might not have to pick us up. So. Okay, so we're good. Yeah. I don't know where you're going. All right, have a good one, right? Yeah, yeah. This is not like the first mission in Spinbolda. That was somewhat anxious. This is the region where most Canadians have been killed. This confusion of mud huts and grape fields has hidden Taliban before. Pika, just past those guys, we're just gonna hop this wall, push extended line until we're fucking centered off on them, and then we'll fuck carry on. just got here, you can see the defensive nightmare it is to attack somewhere like this. They got fucking tunnels and fucking shit all over the place. Trench systems and everything else. Uh, we did notice some of the great putts have piles of brush. They've been finding weapons caches and ammo caches and stuff like that under them. So tomorrow morning we'll discuss future operations. We'll probably go in with some engineer assets back to those great putts. Turn the brush over, light it on fire, see what cooks off kind of stuff. Soldiers in 8th platoon didn't see any Taliban this afternoon. Tomorrow they will. It's often said that a soldier's life is 10% excitement and 90% boredom. You learn to enjoy the downtime when you've got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you got there? I don't know. <laughs> Sloppy Joes. Sloppy something.
As the crazy eights relax, I enjoy the camaraderie. But after you took that shrapnel for me, back in that 810 Warthog Street. He dove on you and the officer? Yes. Yeah, I was there. Quite a little. That is true, right? He dove on you? Yes, he did. Covering his private. Yeah. <laughs> it's covering my privates. You can put a spin on it any way you want, Johnny. I know you love me. In Strong Point Center, Taliban have been spotted about a kilometer and a half away. A LAV moves in from another platoon for a coordinated show of force. Looking for reaction. Master Corporal Randy Power is on communications. Okay, enemy strength is just being set right now. 20 purse, located in graveyard. Three ones, actually. Three ones putting in an indirect uh, 60 millimeter roll. And uh, 20 purse has been spotted in the graveyard there and uh, taking up defensive positions. Rounds are in the air now. Rounds are in the air. One zero seconds. Oh, there it is. I guess it was pretty heavy contact. Did we get any fucking standby movement orders or anything? No. Okay. Here, guys, just come here. I'll tell you what's going on. I guess there's a graveyard. All right. Right now they've got uh, 20 personnel that have moved in that graveyard into a defensive posture. They take an RPG and small arms fire. Three Niner, who was out here doing the show of force, has moved down to support. Three One's got their 60 millimeter mortar out in the indirect roll. Going to fucking put fire in on it. And well, you heard the artillery coming. So it's down there, a couple K down the hill. Eight platoon is not called into the action. The fight is primarily handled from the air. But Randy Power thinks it's only a matter of time. It's um, based on the, how much this intensifies and the effect of what's going on right now. I mean, uh, there's an escalation. There's a, there's a probing on the enemy's part on, on our positions and that. And obviously, they're looking for vulnerabilities. You're right over there. You see them? Oh, they're down now. You see them? Oh, that's a Yeah, I know. They're moving back. They're the ones that are fine. Hey, guys, That night was the most tense we would witness. While many of the veterans at Strong Point North are prepared, maybe even eager to get back at it, the action is up the road at Strong Point Center, where about eight Taliban have been spotted, not a kilometer away this time, but close, very close. I can see all the fucking Taliban coming between fights. The ANA send men out after the Taliban, a brave move by the Afghans, but it means the Canadians can't shoot, even at moving targets. House, right here is house, building. Yeah. Three guys, buildings. Three guys. Yeah, four guys up there is like lights. Yeah. yeah. We see them too. We can see them. Yeah, because you can see in guys. You tell for me. Yes. I, uh, I am talking with the NA communication directors. Yes. yes. Okay. I will let them know. Yeah, I'm done shooting, right? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
We are ordered to put on our kit, our protective gear, stay alert, even sleep with our boots on. There is scattered gunfire all night. Nobody sleeps well. About midnight, possible contact off to the east. At one o'clock, a single shot. At 3.30, a burst of gunfire. And then just before first light, another show of force, pushing the intruders away. It was an initiation for the replacements, and for us, but just another night in Panjue for the crazy eights. I think we're used to it by now, <clears throat> but uh, well, it's Afghanistan. The morning after the Taliban probe. Okay. Now, water and hot sauce. You ready? Yep. Okay, let's go. Soldiers are ingenious. They learn to work with what they've got. Should be going. Yeah, it's going, it's going. A stink bomb is chemical warfare, crazy eight style. <laughs> Think that's funny. <laughs> Fuck <you> guys. <laughs> Where's your gas mask, Kirk? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of good it's doing, yeah. After a few days, I got the rhythm. You're on watch or waiting your turn. I realize that I have stopped thinking of them as replacements and veterans. They are now all soldiers. By our last day, I'm starting to feel at home in the dust, settling in as Private Steve Keegan holds court with a message for home. Tell the camera what is in that letter. This is a letter to Don the Man Cherry, Voice of Canada, and uh, that other guy. Which Ron, eh? Ron? <laughs> Just kidding, Ron. I love you too, buddy. Mm, tell Matt to grab the fucking team by the horns this year and win it. For fuck's sakes. Jesus. I could die this year. And I would have never seen the Leafs win. Keep that on your fucking conscience, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. Well, at least you're not a house fan. But the work never stops, even when it's just children approaching. It's a daily grind. Keep the area safe. Keep yourself alive. And if they aren't talking about hockey, the soldiers are talking about home. My wife says all the time she's got baby fever. What if a baby? What if a baby? And you know what? Two years ago, that would have freaked me out. But now I can't wait. Perspectives change. They change a great, especially when you're in shit like this. So tell me about your home life. What are you missing when you're here? Silly stuff. I mean, there's stuff that when I'm at home makes me angry. Like my little girl will put her to bed and she'll be up there for roughly three minutes and 
come back downstairs a few times and then go back up for another three minutes and come back down and say she had a bad dream when she has only been up there for three minutes. You know, stuff like that that sort of frustrates a parent. It's stuff like that that you almost miss. It's, I don't know, it's strange. Uh, hardest part about anything I've done with the military is being away from them. By far, that's the hardest thing. You're gonna replace me? Let's see. Um, six purse, funny males. Yeah, but uh, they were just huffing that shit off the roof earlier to the front of us, and uh, all of a sudden they've slowed down and they're just kind of dicking around. So I don't know if anything's up there. Just look for any boxes or weird shit that they're taking off. Yeah. What do you worry about? I guess it's how my friends and family's gonna react if I don't make it home. That's the only thing I worry about. I'll be dead, so. I don't have to worry about that, but I worry about how they're going to feel. Worry a little bit how much is this changing me also. When I get home, I'm sure I'm going to be a little, a little different. But I guess I'll deal with that when the time comes. 3-2, let them know we've got a jingle truck that's approximately 200 meters west of uh, my location. Uh, six times fighting age males. I want to get in there and find out what they're doing. Any particular formation? Yeah, let's go fucking... Uh... Go we'll extend the line, let's walk across. Extend the line? Yeah. Extend the line. Yeah. Yeah, the Crazy Eight, uh, we've, we've done quite a bit out here, we've seen quite a bit. And uh, I think that uh, everyone here has handled it well, and uh, nobody's ready to go yet. The mission isn't done, and uh, as long as there's a job to do, uh, you can count on 8th platoon, we'll be here. At the end of October, we headed home. Just before Christmas, I got an email from Private Keegan. Eight platoon stayed out in the Panjaway dust for 57 days straight. They returned to Canada in late February.